We started in the in the book of James, <clears throat> and we're on chapter two today. We've got through chapter one. It was a a long chapter, but it had a lot to say, and I believe that chapter two has a whole lot to say as well. He starts in verse one, and we're just going to get right into the word. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Do we see that today? Do we see favoritism in this world? We see it in our jobs. We see it everywhere. But I just want to go and say one thing right now. God didn't intend for the church to be split. God didn't intend for there to be a church of Christ, for there to be Methodist, for there to be Pentecostal. He didn't intend for all of this to be split. He intended for the church to be the church of Christ, the church that follows Jesus Christ. That's what the church has established, was to be followers of Christ. And we live in a society today to where people want to pick and choose. They show partiality to the word. Because they want to pick and choose, well, well, I like this scripture because this one's okay. But I don't like this scripture because this one, this one right here, it convicts me. It makes me feel like I'm doing something wrong. And if that, if that word convicts us and shows us that we're doing something wrong, then we need to be on our knees and say, Father, forgive me. Father, forgive me because I've sinned. Because this is your holy word. And we don't change the word of God. It's not our place to change it. But he's talking here about partiality, and he goes into verse 2. He says, for example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. Verse 3, if you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor, well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be the rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? Now, I know when we read that verse, we think, so does that mean a rich man can't go to heaven? It's not what it said. It said he has chosen the poor. Why has he chosen the poor? The poor he will be with you always. What we've got to do is we've got to take this into context of what it's talking about, okay? It's talking about James was teaching more to a Jewish congregation, okay? And in the Jewish tradition, there was rich and poor. It wasn't middle class like we have. We've got rich, we've got middle class, we've got poor. And what James was teaching to, he was teaching to, uh, to, these, to the Jewish culture, and they got taught when they were rich, they were rich. They even wore rings on fingers. They wore these gold rings on their fingers to show how wealthy they were. I mean, they flaunted it. They didn't just go around and and be thankful for what they had. They flaunted their wealth. Okay? And that's what he's bringing into context here. Because these people would shun the poor people. They didn't want anything to do with them because they wasn't good enough. Well, this is where where I see Christ coming in in the picture in my life. It don't matter what I have. I can be living under a bridge right, be living at a tent on the Brazos River. But as long as I have Jesus Christ, I have life. I have a home in heaven. See, we all fall into that trap of, of material goods. We all fall into that trap. I'm guilty. I have too at one time. I don't care about it now, but I have fell into it. And what we need to understand is We don't need to shun people for what they have or what they don't have. What we see today, and and like I said, this is referring to the Jewish culture, but, but it also refers today. Do we see partiality today? Do we see it in the church? Absolutely. I'm talking about the church as a whole. We see it in the church? Yes. Do we see it in the world? Absolutely. Absolutely. How many people are going to speak to you that are wealthy that walk by? Now, Jesus and Matthew... Uh, I believe it's 19 and 24. Um, he talks about uh, where it, it says that, and again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And at this time, what he's talking about, the camel going through the eye of a needle, there was a doorway into the city. And a camel couldn't fit through that doorway. It was a small doorway. So, but what he's saying is he's saying because 
Not that a rich man can't go to heaven. But what happens when people get money? Have you ever known anybody that didn't have nothing? And then they got something. And what happened when they got something? Did they change? Not everybody. I know people that's got money. I've known some people that's went to this church that some of the that you'd never even know they had a dime because they don't flaunt it. So this is not saying a rich man can't go to church or can't go to heaven, excuse me. It's not saying a rich man can't go to heaven. But what it's saying is that when you get wealth, you lose Christ because you get selfish. And you say, well, what do I need? What do I need God for? You know, when, when you're constantly in an attitude of prayer and you're constantly looking to God to be the provider of your life, to be the one that takes care of you, then you ain't worried about nothing else. See, all of this is leading up to faith, and we're going to get to that here in just a minute. But this is all leading up to what faith does for us. But we need to understand that partiality, it, it, we don't need to be discriminating against anyone because everyone, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's, what import, that's what's important about God's word is that he loves everybody. But he said, the poor I know is going to be with me because they're going to rely on me. They ain't going to rely on their selfish ambition or their selfish needs. They're going to rely on, on me to, to guide them and, and to lead them in, in everything. He says, listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? Verse 6, but you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures love your neighbor as yourself but if you favor someone if you favor some people over others you are committing a sin you are guilty of breaking the law for the person who keeps all the law except one is as guilty as the person who has broken all of God's laws for the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder so if you murder someone but do not commit adultery you have still broken the law. Again, he's speaking to the Jews here. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. So here he's bringing it back to the, to the Ten Commandments, the law of Moses. And he's saying that if you break one commandment, or if another man breaks ten commandments, it, you still broke it. And what he's talking about is he's explaining to them, do you want to be judged by the law, or do you want to be judged by grace? Because you're going to be judged by the law that sets you free. So where do you choose to live? Do you choose to live by the grace in Christ? I'm saved by grace through faith. Or do you want to live by, I'm going to follow the ten commandments? Where are you going to be judged by the law? And if you've broken one, you're out. You're not going to make it in. So Jesus says, I've given you more grace. I've given you this grace. Now, I want to explain something here before we move on. Is That doesn't mean that we go out and break the commandments because we're under grace. Okay? Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. Okay? By grace. Because we're not going to ever fulfill the whole law. But we need to make sure that we do our best to follow Christ. And in following Christ, we stay focused on him then we do the things that he calls us to do and not break the laws. But we need to understand that we're saved by grace through faith, not by the law. The law was there to tell us what good and evil is. Verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of, save, can that kind of faith save anyone? Okay, right here is a very important. This is a very important scripture right here. And I'm going to tell you why. Because, see, many people believe that Paul is, I mean, uh, James is contradicting Paul. Because Paul teaches you're saved by faith and nothing else. Faith alone. That's what Paul teaches. And people say, well, James teaches that you're saved by works. No, he doesn't teach you're saved by works. When you got up this morning and got in your vehicle, 
Did it drive you to, uh, I know they're coming out with self-driving vehicles, but did your vehicle today drive you to church? No. Did it start itself? Well, I know there's remote start, so just stay with me here, okay? Did it turn the key and start itself? No. You had to have faith to get in that vehicle and to turn the key to start it. You had to have faith to do that. You had to have faith that it would start. And believe me, there's been vehicles that I've owned in my lifetime that I didn't know if it was going to start when I turned the key or not. And I'm sure all of us have had them. But we have to have faith that when we turn that key that it starts. Folks, nothing in life that you can do is without faith. I couldn't do the job that God has blessed me to do without faith. I couldn't be standing up here and sharing the gospel if it wasn't for the faith in Jesus Christ that I have. I couldn't drive to Houston, Texas and back in one piece without faith. Amen? We have to understand that everything we do is faith. Whether it's faith in God or whether it's faith in, in material goods, it's still faith, right? I'd rather put my faith in Jesus than my faith in material goods. So we need to understand when he says here, what good is it if we say we have faith but we don't show it with our actions? What James is saying is faith without works is what? It's dead faith. If you don't put action to your faith, then what do you have? You go back to the Old Testament and you, and you read about Abraham and, and you read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and you read about David and Goliath. You read about all of these and, and we kind of we put these stories off. And we look at them as, as kids' stories. But, folks, let me tell you something. These ain't kids' stories. These are real events that happen in time. These are real events that, by faith, God showed himself to a world that was lost and undone. By faith, he showed that a little shepherd boy could take a little sling and a stone, and he could sling it out, and it could hit a man, a, a giant, and take him to the ground. Let me tell you what, a little shepherd boy like David and a big giant like Goliath, it doesn't add up. It doesn't add up that he could, he could whoop somebody that big. So what else could it be but faith? But if he didn't do what God told him, what did the Lord tell him? He said, you go get five stones and five smooth stones. God even told him to what kind of stone to get. He didn't say just go find a rock. He said, you get five stones and you don't get just five. When you get the five, you make sure they're smooth. It only took one, but he had to get five because God told him to get five. That's faith. And when he took that stone and when he, got, he told him, he said, I come to you with the spear. He said, you come to me with the spear and the sword is what David told Goliath. He said, but I come to you in the name of the Lord today. The God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will deliver you into my hands. He didn't say, I'm going to whip you. He said, my God is going to whip you. And the reason he said that is because he had faith. He knew that with faith, I can move any mountain that stands in front of me. So we have to understand that only by faith that anything can happen. But if you don't put your faith into action, your faith doesn't move. It's dead. It doesn't exist. And if our faith doesn't exist, then how are we going to move any mountain in our life? We're not going to move a mountain in our life if our faith does not exist. We have to put it into action. We have to let our faith be moved. And we have to let it be moved by the Holy Spirit. Verse 15, he says, Suppose you see a brother or a sister who has no food or clothing. And you say, Goodbye. Have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? Somebody comes up to you and they need something to eat. Need a few groceries. I've been guilty. Well, why don't you get a job? Why don't you take care of yourself? It's not my place to take care of you. Rainy busted me this week. I told her, I said, I've gotten my whole life. I've taken care of myself and not asked nobody for nothing. She said, no, your whole life God has taken care of you. That's right. I wouldn't be it where I'm at today. I wouldn't be in my career. I wouldn't be anywhere that I'm at today without Jesus Christ. I can't do anything without him. And that's what he's telling us. Is he's telling us, we just tell these people to go away. Now we put our faith into action. We feed them. We do the food drive. We do the food drive and we get food to help people that's in need. And that's what I love about this congregation because this church has helped so many people. And it's by faith that it's helped people. 
that's been in need throughout the years. It says so he says so. Verse 17, so you see faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds or works, it is dead and useless. Now, I'm reading out the New Living Translation this morning, and the reason I am is because I like the way it words it. Unless it produces good deeds. And it says deeds instead of works. Same meaning, similar. But we have to put our faith into action. We have to do what God calls us to do. And when, we, when God tells you to do something, let me tell you out of experience, don't hesitate. Because when we hesitate, God's going to use somebody else. He's not going to use you if you're not willing. He wants you to be willing, and he wants to use you. And there's a lot of people in this, word, in this world that need to see faith. They need to see faith in action. They need to see that people can put their feet to their faith. They need to see that people care about them. They don't know their name. Because guess what? The King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one that hung on the cross and now has, been, has risen, and we're going to celebrate that here in just a few weeks, the risen Savior that we serve. He knows my name. He knows your name. He knows every name. We should be so thankful that he knows our name. He says, verse 19, well, let's go back, sorry, 18. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith and others have deeds, good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. See, it's easy to say I have faith. I have faith that God will move mountains. But then when the mountain comes, and it's in the road in front of you, spiritually speaking. Where's your faith? Are you showing your faith? Is it being manifested to, to people around you? Or are you just saying, God, why me, Lord? Where did, the, where did this mountain come from? Why did you put this in my path? We've all been guilty. I, sure, I know I have. God, why now? Why me? But that's not what God calls us to. He calls us to faith and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We got to let God take take and run with it. Verse nineteen, he says, "You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good, good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror." He says, "You have faith. Say you have faith, and you believe that there is one God." Even the devil and his demons believe there's one God. Isn't that something? There's people on this earth. There's people that are lost and dying and spend an eternity separated from God, which is hell. Because they don't have faith in the risen Savior. He said even the demons, even Satan himself believes that there's only one God. Isn't that something? Even Satan believes there's only one God. But mankind can't get past themselves to see that there's only one God. So what is our job? Our job is to walk by faith, not by sight. Our job is to show a world that's lost and dying what faith is by our deeds. Our deeds and our works and our faith shows people that there is a God, there is one God, and He is Lord of all, and He is the King of kings, and He will save you from your misery. He will save you from your turmoil. But we've got to put into practice our faith so that people can see that. Because see, how many times you come across people during the day and somebody might ask you, uh, well, oh, you're a Christian? Well, hmm, that's good. Well, I ain't seen much of Christianity uh, in your life. I didn't know you was a Christian. I want to tell you something. I've learned this the hard way. That we should never have to open our mouth and tell somebody that we follow Jesus Christ. How we walk, how we talk, how we live are to show Jesus Christ to everybody around us. Our actions, which is by faith, should show that we are followers of Jesus Christ. If we stand before a jury, if you was on trial today for being a Christian, would you be guilty? Would you be guilty? 
would the jury be able to say without a shadow of a doubt he's guilty of being a Christian? Or would they say, I don't know. I don't know if he's guilty or not. That's something we need to think about. Verse 20, he says, how foolish can you see that faith without words, faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember uh, that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. We know the story of Abraham and Isaac. He took his son. We used to, talked about this a few weeks ago, but he took his son, and he took him up to be sacrificed. See, what we've never talked about, though, is what if his son said, I ain't going? What if he fought? What if he fought with his daddy because he didn't want to go? He didn't. He didn't fight his daddy. He did ask him, well, where's the sacrifice? He told him, he said, get the wood and carry it up the, up the mountain. And he said, where's the sacrifice? He knew what the sacrifice was. And he went anyway. Yet he carried the wood up the mountain, knowing he was the sacrifice that was going to be taken. Imagine the father. Imagine as a dad, God told you to take your son and put him on an altar and to take a knife and to take his life. Could you do it? Would you do it? We would all think that's crazy, wouldn't we? We would think, what in the world? I ain't going to do that. But this man had enough faith that he said, if God could, and then I'm, I'm, I'm saying what I believe he thought. If God can take his life, if God wants me to sacrifice him, then he can bring his life, bring him back to life. But God provided a way out. He provided a way out just like he does for you and me. See, when you put your faith into action, there's always a way out. But you've got to use that action. You've got to put your faith into movement. And then God will show you, I've got you in the palm of my hand. He tells us in Corinthians, he says, I will not put more on you than you can bear or handle, if you will. I'm not going to put more on you than you can stand. So if we will put that faith into action, he will show us what the way out is. And we need to remember that. Verse 23, and he says, And so it happened just as the Scripture says, Abraham believed God and counted. God counted to him as righteousness because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. Praise God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. This is the story of Jericho. And they're going into Jericho, and they sent these two spies into Jericho, Joshua did. And these two spies went in. And this, this harlot, this Rahab, this harlot, she took these two spies in, and when, when they were looking for them, they were searching for them. And they were in fear. The people of Jericho was in fear because they knew that this God, the only God, the one true God, they were fearing the people that served him because they knew that they would lose. They would lose the war. They wasn't going to win this battle. So Rahab, she took these people, she took these two men in by faith. She took these two men in and hit them on her rooftop. And the men come looking for them. They said, we know these spies were here at your house. We know you're hiding them. So where are they? What are you gonna, where are they at? And she said, they left. They, went, they headed for the hills, if you will. They took off when she had them hit on the roof. And then after that, after they were taken, I mean, after they, they left, these two spies, she rescued them. And she told them, she said, I want to ask one thing. is that you save me and my brothers, my sisters, and my mother, and my father. You save us. And don't destroy us because I helped you. And they told her. They said, every one of you, get your family and make sure they're in this house. And you have the red sash on, on, the, on the door. And your family will be protected. They will, not be they will not be destroyed when we take Jericho. 
So she knew. She put faith into action. She got her family and she put them in that house. And when the walls of Jericho came down, they did not harm her or her family. They were protected. Her faith saved her life and her family because she put it into action. She did what she was told to do. Now think about this. If Joshua and them, Joshua and the army, think if they would have marched around the city six times and said that's good enough. God told them to march around the city seven times. Let's say they do six times. Would the walls of Jericho fail? No. Because, see, God's a specific God. And when he tells you to do something, you do it to the specific that he tells you to do it. Just like he told David, five smooth stones. He told Joshua, march around there seven times. He said, march around six days, and on the seventh day I will deliver this city into your hands. And that's what we need to understand is it's by faith through works is what shows that we have faith. We're not saved by the works. We're saved by grace. See, that's where people get all of this twisted up. We're saved by grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us that. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not a, and it's a gift of God, not by yourselves. It's not of yourselves. It's lest anyone should boast. It's a gift of God that he has given us, his son. That's grace. And that faith means that you've got to put your faith in him and believe in him. And in doing that, you have to put it into action. What did the disciples do when Jesus left? They started the church. The church was established in the book of Acts. The first church was established when Jesus ascended into heaven. Had they not been obedient and did what Jesus told them to do, where would the world be today? They put their faith into action. They put their faith into action. The, the scriptures that I opened with, with Peter, when he was addressing the Sanhedrin, and he said, Jesus, whom you crucified, that's why this man's healed. They put their faith into action, and they dealt with um, an excruciating deaths. They were persecuted. They were, they were all different types of things happened to them because of their faith. Is it going to come back to that one day? Is it going to come back to the persecution? To where somebody comes up to us and if it says, are you a follower of Jesus? And if you are, you're going to get chained and bound and thrown into prison? Are they going to come in here and throw cuffs on me and drag me out one day? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But I can tell you this. My faith will stand when I can't stand any longer. Because I choose to trust in my Savior. Because what can man do to me? If God is for us, what can man do for me? Who can be against us? That's what the Scripture says in Romans. If God is for us, who can be against us? What can man do to me? Man can do a lot of things to me, but he cannot kill my soul. He cannot take away what Jesus Christ has given me. Amen? Amen. Let us close in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for giving us this lesson this morning about faith by works. Because faith without it is dead. It is, it's dead faith. And the only way that we can have faith is to put it into action. Put feet to our faith. Father, I pray as we walk through this, this world that we live in this next week that we'll look at things a little different. That we'll, put, we'll choose to put our faith in you and to put it in action. That we'll let people see that we love you. Let people see that we desire to follow after you. Because, folks, uh, Father, I want to see folks saved. I want to see a lost and dying world come to the acknowledgement of Jesus Christ. Time is short. I've heard it my whole life that time is short. But I believe with all of my heart it's shorter now than it's ever been. And, and I don't know the day or the hour. Only, only the Father knows. But I do know this. We're one day closer to Jesus Christ coming to take us home. Lord, I just ask you today that you let us be ready. Don't come back for a church that ain't ready. Let us be ready. Open our hearts and open our minds to receive your holy word that we will make ourselves ready to meet you. 
Because if you came through that door right now, we want to make sure we're ready. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for the time. And as we uh, partake of the Lord's Supper here in just a few minutes, I pray, Father, that we would just make, we would um, clear our hearts, ask for forgiveness, repent of anything that we got that's impure, that we do not take of the Lord's Supper in vain, but that we take of it and repent with a repenting heart. Father, we love you and praise you, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.